Okay, I think uh, we should start now, uh, even if some people will come in a minute. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Harry Lehmann. Uh, Harry Lehmann is a philosopher located in Berlin, and um, he has uh, studied uh, physics at the University of St. Petersburg. Uh, and after finishing that study, uh, he has studied uh, philosophy in Berlin. He has uh, published a huge number of books. Uh, all are um, concerned about art and uh, aesthetics, uh, just to mention a few, Autonome Kunstkritik, Die Digitale Revolution der Musik, oder Die Flüchtige Weiter Kunst, Ästhetik nach Luhmann, uh, just recently Gehaltsästhetik, Eine Kunstphilosophie. And uh, Harry Lehmann has changed his title a little, a little bit. The new, the new title is AI, Art, and the Creativity Space of the Arts. And uh, Mr. Lehmann, we are happy to listen to your talk. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, and thank you very much for the invitation to the conference, Humanities and the Rise of AI. The general topic of my lecture is AI art. So I will start with an overview of the state of the AI art. But the guiding question of my talk is, how creative is the AI art that is beginning to emerge today? Ahmed Elgamal, along with his team at Rutgers University, has developed an autonomous AI artist. It's the first time an artificial intelligence has created art without human intervention, wrote Elgamal. The program is called ICAN and is based on a 2014 invention by Ian Goodfellow called Generative Adversarial Network or GAN for short. When you train such GANs for portraits, you get this kind of blurry faces. Though the use of GANs produces a specific Francis Bacon-like AI style, also called GANism. Elgamas' goal was to transform GANs into CANs, that is to transform a generative adversarial network into a creative adversarial network by formulating an additional criterion. ICAN or AI CAN is just the name for a special CAN, or rather, ICAN is a CAN with a pun. ICAN is structured in such a way that, on the one hand, it uses over 100,000 images from all styles and genres of the last 500 years of Western art to learn what distinguishes a painting that is art from a mere image that is not art. But on the other hand, ICANN is trained to ensure that the newly generated image does not resemble any known art style. In the end, the program managed to create these remarkable abstract images. As a purely scientific research project, ICANN could have ended here without any major impact on the art world. But the team took some additional steps. First, they developed a visual Turing test that compared the images generated by ICANN with images from Art Basel 2016. The astonishing result was that the test subjects could no longer distinguish whether an image had been created by a human or a machine. In addition, the paintings were shown in exhibitions and sold for high five-figure sums. And finally, Ahmed Elgamal and art historian Marian Mazzone published the essay Art, Creativity and the Potential of Artificial Intelligence. This essay can certainly be read as a challenge to art philosophy, as it attempts to reformulate fundamental aesthetic terms. The authors make three thought-provoking statements with respect to ICON. AI art is art, AI art is conceptual art, and AI art is creative. Before I will discuss these far-reaching theses, I would like to present a few other examples of AI art. Here you can see the interactive installation of Memo Actin Learning to See from 2017. In the foreground, the exhibition visitor can move objects such as a rack 
and a charging cable on a table. A camera records these hand movements, which can be seen directly on the left screen. The same information is simultaneously sent to an artificial neural network that has been trained on ocean images, fire images, clouds and flower images. Accordingly, the network interprets the hand movements with the rack and the cable as water, fire, clouds and flowers, what can be seen on the right screen. I consider learning to see a key work of AI art because it reflects its basic principles in a very poetic way. The deep learning systems that have made today's emerging AI possible learn to see the world from the data and images with which they have been trained. Helena Zarin took some photos in the department store Bad Bath and Beyond and trained again with them. She then selected some of these images and arranged them into a grid, creating an aesthetically very attractive and interesting visual work. What I especially like about this work are the ironic titles. Everyday household items from the department store Bed Bath and Beyond became abstract art that is something way beyond ordinary life. And the whole series is called latent shelfie in an allusion to the selfie. Chris Peters trained Gans with landscape paintings of tonalism, a romanticizing style of painting that had developed in America between 1880 and 1915. He then selected some of these AI images and painted them himself with oil paint on canvas. In the logic of the art system, it would be considered kitsch if Peters were still painting in the style of tonalism today. For that you need at least a good artistic reason, that is, a strong concept, such as using AI as an image generator. This is Mario Klingmann's installation Memories of Passerby 1 from 2018. The Gans were each trained with portraits of men and women from the 17th to the 19th centuries. Visitors were encouraged for a moment to take a seat in this chair. The wooden box under the screens constantly creates new, unique portraits in Ganesim style. So this is here a time-lapse mode and in real time, of course, the faces change much slower. While Memo Acton's work demonstrates the basic principle of AI art, the algorithm sees what it has learned, Klingmann's work makes visible the telos of all AI art, namely the infinite stream of artificially generated images. The work shows, in Hegel's words, a bad infinity unleashed by AI in the arts. In this respect, I consider Memories of Passerby 1 to be as much a keywork of AI art as Learning to See by Memo Acton. If you look at the previous examples, it becomes clear that it is not the AI image on their own that are considered AI art, but that these AI images are first valorized into art. So far, we have been able to observe at least four such strategies of art valorization. The Turing test, the use of irony, manual craft, and the media-specific self-reflection. My last example of AI art is almost completely absorbed in such valorization strategies. It is also the example with the biggest media echo that AI art has triggered so far. 
This AI painting, created by the French three-person artist collective Obvious, was sold by Christie's auction house for nearly half a million dollars. However, this great success on the art market was met with some reluctance in the AI art community. The criticism was that the artist collective had only used a freely available GAN from another AI artist without programming and training it themselves. It was also said that the aesthetic quality of the AI image was rather poor. Indeed, the Paris-based artist collective was less interested in technical and aesthetic issues than in artistic strategies. This already starts with the title Edmond de Bellamy. Bellamy means the lovely friend in French and is an allusion to the name Goodfellow, the inventor of the Gens. Another valorization is the signature, which consists of a mathematical formula underlying the AI algorithm used to produce the image. In addition, the printing of the image is valorized by the gilt frame as a classical painting. The work Edmond de Bellamy is also part of a fictional family tree and is contextualized in this way in a story. The claim below that the Bellamy family tree represents the art history of several centuries from the point of view of AI is, of course, a ludicrous hoax. Another valorization is this artistic manifesto in the spirit of the historical avant-garde. A press release with this provocative slogan, creativity is not just for humans, is also part of this kind of art valorization with theoretical statements. And last but not least, the artist collective created this abstract logo in reference to the Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Men. As in Renaissance items, a new unity of art and science is symbolized here in the light of AI. The artist collective has virtually overloaded the work at Monte Bellamy with valorization strategies. This reveals an internal conflict in the AI art community. The pioneers of AI art are for the most part professional programmers or software engineers and are rarely educated at art schools or socialized in art scenes. However, the artists collective from Paris seems to be quite familiar with art history, art theory and the mechanisms of the art market. The subtle irony of the story is that technologically advanced AI art has been hacked by old-fashioned analog art, to use the jargon of the digital natives. This brief overview of AI art in part one highlights a contradiction. On the one hand, there is a few that deep learning systems themselves are creative and produce art, on the other hand, AI artists also work with a variety of valorization strategies so that one could think that only the creative human intervention transforms an AI image into works of art. In the following second part, I would like to outline very briefly a model of aesthetic modernity on the basis of which this contradiction can be discussed and analyzed. The core idea of this model is that in the 20th century, an internal differentiation process took place in the art system and that the major cesuras of modern art history can thus be reconstructed. This process consisted in a decoupling of three essential components of art communication, the work, the medium and the concept. In the fine arts of the 19th century, these three components were tightly coupled. In the 21st century, there is art where these components are only loosely coupled to each other. The driving force behind this history of differentiation is the ability of the modern arts to negate all conventional notions of art. Until the 19th century, the medium of the fine arts intensified 
the expression and experience of beauty. At the beginning of the 20th century, the negation of the medium leads to the art of classical modernism with its isms. Here, specific concepts such as the concept of cubism or expressionism determine the way in which the aesthetic material is to be arranged in an artwork. In the next step, the negation of the artwork constitutes the art of the historical avant-garde, whose most radical manifestation is conceptual art. Here, art is reduced to the perceptual representation of a concept. Strictly speaking, conceptual art can be defined by an isomorphism principle. Conceptual art forms a one-to-one -one relationship between a concept and a simple perceptual image that is a percept. The erased de Kooning drawing from Robert Rauschenberg is exemplary for this isomorphism. The concept of the work is given by the title, namely to erase a drawing by de Kooning, and what one can perceive is exactly such an erased drawing. Postmodern art overcomes the avant-garde by negating a strong taboo of the avant-garde, namely to work in the classical medium of the fine arts with its preference for the aesthetic value of beauty, central perspective and figurative representation. We are dealing here with a double negation, a negation of the negation of the medium of the visual arts. In postmodern art, for example, figurative painting returns, but this return is now mediated through the concepts of irony and quotation. Roy Lichtenstein quotes comics, for example. This kind of conceptual mediatedness is represented in the model with a gap between the two segments of medium and concept. And in the meantime, contemporary art has also emancipated itself from postmodern art with the help of a negation of the negation of the artwork. Thus, not only the use of the media, but also the artwork itself is conceptually mediated now. The three gaps between the three segments in the circle symbolize not only this new kind of conceptual mediatedness, but they also signify new degrees of freedom in the production and reception of art gained in the art system of the 20th century. Two aspects in particular are important for our further considerations of AI art. First, with this newly gained freedoms of contemporary art, the creativity space of art also expands. Second, with this model, we can comprehend a paradigm shift that took place in the 20th century. In classical modernism, newness was generated through the creation of new aesthetic material, which led to genuinely new aesthetic experiences for the recipient. Art is created here under the paradigm of material aesthetics. However, this idea of newness was exhausted very quickly. Sooner or later, in all art genres, people have noticed that it is not longer possible to create new isms and styles. But newness can also be generated by new aesthetic content, whereby I prefer to speak not of content but of Gehalt here. Gehalt is a non-translatable German term in the philosophical tradition of Hegel and Adorno. For our purposes, the following short definition of Gehalt will be sufficient. Gehalt is a content created through the interpretation of an artwork. Conceptual art thus appears as a turning point in modern arts. It marks a zero point in art history where a paradigm shift from material aesthetic to Gehalt aesthetic took place. This Gehalt aesthetic turn in the 20th century is essential for assessing the creativity space of AI art today. This was the model of aesthetic modernity in a nutshell. For those who have further interest in this topic, 
I have developed the model for music in the book, The Digital Revolution of Music and Music Philosophy, and for the visual arts in the book, Gehaltsesthetic and Art Philosophy. On my YouTube channel, you can also find lectures in German and English about the model and about conceptual art with its isomorphism principle. I come to the third and last part of my talk, where I will try to place AI art in this theoretical framework. What is crucial here is that this model also allows us to understand how the creativity space of the arts has expanded in the 20th century. Let's return to Ahmed Elgamal's visual Turing test. Above, you see images from Art Basel 2016. Below, you see icon images. Both sets of images were used in that Turing test. Amazingly, Art Basel and ICANN arrive at the same kind of universal abstract modernism. And the explanation for this is that they solve the same optimization problem. The question is, how can the attractiveness of images be optimized when all possibilities of radical aesthetic innovation have been exhausted and new styles and isms can no longer be invented? Under these conditions, the art market will avoid any recognizable style because for the buyers it looks old-fashioned and not new. And exactly this style avoidance is also encoded in ICANN. The mode of creativity that remains is the creativity of infinite variation. Apparently, ICANN identifies figurative painting itself as a style and in this respect tries to avoid any realism. At that point, uncompromising artists like Marcel Duchamp have abandoned the exhausted genre of painting and created conceptual art instead. Basically, the AI artists just presented have taken this path with their valorization strategies. Their work is not conceptual art in the strict sense of the isomorphism principle, but concept-based art. Such concept-based AI art has a much broader creativity space because it is essentially about a novel combination of AI images with concepts. However, I would guess that with the development of an artificial general intelligence, AGI for short, even such concept-based art will face competition from AI. Valorization strategies and art concepts in general can be found in thousands and thousands of works in art history. Art concepts are not always invented for the first time, but usually copied and modified. Once such repetition occur, AGI systems will also be able to recognize these patterns and operate with them. Thus, I would expect AGI systems in the future to generate a variety of concepts that define the framework in which AI images are to be perceived and interpreted. What does it mean? Could the development of AGI eventually lead to the human artist being supplanted by an autonomous AI artist? Or is there such a thing as a human creativity space that is inaccessible to machines? To be able to discuss this question, we need to look back at the entire creativity space that has opened up for the arts in the 20th century. Let's take a closer look at a famous example. An example that can stand for an imminent differentiation of medium work and concept. My example is Maurizio Catalan's La Nona Ora from 1999. The sculpture shows Pope John Paul II at the moment when he was hit by a meteorite and cries out as Jesus once did on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The title, The Ninth Hour, hints indirectly to this evil quotation. Catalan's work is usually understood as blasphemy. In my opinion, the work also proves the existence of God, the probability 
is so extremely low by earthly standards that a meteorite would strike a pope that a divine intervention would actually be needed for this. The artwork thus simultaneously proves the existence and non-existence of God, which in turn can be seen as a symbol for the status of religion in liberal democracies. This once again raises the crucial question. Is it conceivable that at some point in the future an artificial general intelligence could create such artwork? The work actually has only five elements. The Pope, the meteorite, the broken glass, the red carpet and the Bible reference. So what requirements would an AI have to fulfill to be able to assemble an artwork from five such building blocks. One reason why the development of an artificial general intelligence has failed so far is that computers have no common sense. Common sense is also required in the reception of this work, for example, to understand that this stone is a meteorite. The artwork does not directly provide you with this information. However, the broken glass on the red carpet activates the viewer's common sense and suggests a meteorite impact. The real problem of AI art, however, is not that such works presuppose common sense knowledge, but rather that they create uncommon sense. Artworks like this are the real singularity on Earth as a compact synthesis of meaning. Such artwork is incomparable to anything that exists in reality. I suspect even an artificial general intelligence could learn nothing from thousands and thousands of such examples. This synthesis of meaning that a human artist accomplishes in such works does not follow any general criteria but is highly idiosyncratic. The decision that these five elements form a context of meaning that might be relevant to another person or to society is based on the unique self-organization of the human brain. And here, early childhood imprints, conversations, unhappy loves, books, mental disorders, and all sorts of things can play a role. An AI that could create works like the Ninth Hour would have to be an AI that can subjectify itself. Such AI subjectification cannot simply be equated with AI embodiment or AI consciousness, which is often cited as a prerequisite for the development of AGI. Rather, such subjectified AI would require self-consciousness and social interaction with other subjectified AIs. Actually, such a hypothetical AI subject would have to live a life like a human being. Here, the whole thought experiment gets into a circular argument. One is talking about an artificial intelligence which could only develop under the human condition. Let's summarize. The creativity space of art is a very broad field. There is the creativity of infinite variation of which AI art algorithms such as ICON are already capable today. There is concept-based creativity in art which would require a general artificial intelligence with common sense knowledge. And there is the creativity of the uncommon sense in relation to which the notion artificial intelligence must be humanized and the word artificial loses all its meaning. So my conclusion and hypothesis would be that AI art can unfold under the exhausted paradigm of material aesthetics. However, the idea that AI art could also create full-blown Gehalt aesthetic artwork seems to be a fallacy. For the humanities, however, this fallacy would be great news. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Lehmann, for this inspiring talk, uh, which opens a new dimension now to our conference about AI and art. You are the first lecturer who is focusing on that aspect. And 
I'm pretty sure there are questions. If not, I have one at the very beginning. Well, I'm very, um, uh, I very much like your your model because it's simple and it explains a lot. Uh, nevertheless, <laughs> you can always uh, ask questions to a model and see whether it can uh, can be further developed. I, I was thinking we were talking about the uh, valorization aspect. Yeah, thank you for that. For the valorization aspect in these in this whole discourse of arts, and I was thinking um, uh, whether the, uh, the 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 timeline the timeline of 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 all these processes where you said okay um, maybe you can go back to the other slide where you show these models yeah. you said that that for postmodernism or um, uh, the avant-garde there are certain certain uh, aspects in the forefront like uh, for the avant-garde it's only the relation between concept conceptualization and perceptualization and I would like to ask you how do you how do you deal with with uh, for example um, art examples like uh, from Marcel Duchamp uh, the ready-mades like uh, Fontaine which is for me a certain way to deconstruct uh, the 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 whole concept of art uh, because it deconstructs kind of you know the the perception aspects and it's it's of course strong in the conceptualization how and, and where did, would you would you place that that kind of of art and how would that um, attempt uh, like these ready-mades fit to the AI art logic? So uh, the Champs ready-mades are a prime example for conceptual art. Here you have really this isomorphism of percept and concept. How does it fit to uh, AI art? I think it is a challenge. In the discussion of AI art and in the AI art community, there is an awareness of conceptual art, and but in general, there is not a good theory of, of what really conceptual art is. And in the last um, two, two, three decades, it became more and more common that any art is called conceptual art. So uh, there is a theoretical lack in this. But I think for AI art, uh, this tough conceptual art is, is a challenge because it, it's it's probably the last thing what you can generate by AI, or probably it's not. It will not be possible at all if it's a genuine, a new idea like an idea from Duchamp. Thank you very much. I hand over to Thomas Relay. Hi. Thanks. Thanks so much. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can hear you very well. Great. I just wanted to really just to ask you to, you mentioned in passing that you, you also uh, have some stuff on, on music and AI music. Um, and I just wondered how, how your model differs just on the face of it, you know, music insofar as it's an abstract, a work of music is an abstract thing. The medium is much less important, or at least mm -hmm. plays a very different role. And of course, music is at least most of it non-representational. And, you know, in music, we don't really have anything like conceptual art, at least not in the same way. So I just wanted to, if you could say a little bit about how, how your model differs for the case of music. Yes. Uh, actually, I published this model first in um, a music journal, Music and Aesthetic, in 2006. And I was sure that the new music system, that is the art music in, in a way, which follows Schoenberg, that uh, this type of art music is uh, 40, 30 years behind the this model. It's behind the... Um, the development of, of the visual arts, because the, in music, you have the same problem. Since the 1970s, there has been no new ism invented. So there, there have been great invention, but like serialism, minimalism, music concrete instrumental, spectralism, and, and, and all these types of isms, you have a lot in new music, but this development stopped also in the 1980s. And, the, and I was interested in the reason for this, and there are institutional reasons, because the whole music institution is built to perform notated music on acoustic instruments. And my idea was that with the digital revolution, this still stand uh, will overcome, and you will have something like 
conceptual music and indeed in 2008 they are developed inside this new music scene a genre like I call it digital uh, conceptual music. I developed the model in order to, to, to describe the new development in art music, uh, which is going now to Gehalt Aesthetic too. Thank you very much. Uh, next question from Till Denbeck. Thank you very much uh, for this wonderfully clear um, presentation. I uh, highly appreciate how you, um, I don't know how you have um, enriched uh, philosophical aesthetics, uh, not only with a broad knowledge of art history, which is lacking there sometimes, but also with uh, what you what you take from media history, from systems theory and theory and all these things. And I particularly like uh, how you came up with uh, the conclusion, the, the good message to the humanities. And uh, <laughs> uh, so the, 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 the highlighting of singularity and uh, now I was wondering um, if we, I mean, if, is it really a good message for the humanities? Of course, it, it's uh, the, the, the artwork that, you know, I mean, if, be it uh, music, be it uh, visual arts, be it uh, literary text, but yes, it's singular. But how about our work? Um, is, it, is it the same for us? I mean, if we do interpretation, if we do um, uh, literary studies or art studies uh, that are really devoted to the singular work, um, how far will AI get in reproducing that? That's just a question okay. out of curiosity. Um, yeah, okay. What do you think um, about that? My idea is that AI will do the work of the devil. So if you look here, to, for instance, the AI art will now create images which are sold on the art market in the art Basel. And that will have an impact. So in this art market, you have other mod motives that um, painters are creating such works for a rich class of people. And in a way, it's, it's not really innovative because the, there is no invention of a new ism, of a new style or something like that. That is not possible. But you have a blind spot, of course, in the art market. Uh, but I think uh, these, if you can technologically produce such images, they have even an advantage because it's technologically new and it will be, will be a kind of democratization of these abstract images. So I think AI art will push the boundaries more and more in the direction of conceptualization and in the direction of Gehalt aesthetic. And then the more you go in the direction of Gehalt aesthetic, the more you have the autonomous art work. I, I was interested in the in the in my work. So I, if I interpret uh, um, uh, artworks, literary, literary or, 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 or images or musical pieces, what we do in philology, so to speak. Yeah. Um, yeah. How far will, will will our work be replaceable by AI? But I assume from what I from your, what you said that the answer is the same. I think that this process of interpreting and looking inside of an artwork or in a text for references, which uh, triggers the self-organization process of meaning creation in an artwork, uh, this is. Uh, uh, this is, uh, will become more important and it's not in danger by any AI. Okay, very short question. Thanks a lot for the, for the presentation. I think your model works extremely well and I'm always getting a bit skeptical when a model works so well. <laughs> so I'm, in, is, uh, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm trying to find a way to, to, to criticize it a bit and maybe one, one way would be that, I mean, like m many models, this model leaves us a bit with an if or uh, decision, right? So there's there's material aesthetics, which is something that AI art can contribute to, but it's kind of old fashioned. And then we have Gehalt aesthetics. And as you just said, maybe in 100 years, because of AI arts, we will still have Gehalt aesthetics and still be in the same phase of contemporary art that we are already in for like 20 years or so already. So, um, my question will be, is there nothing third? Can, you, can, can we think of something new, of something that could, some new paradigm shift that could come up? 
or is this not even is this is this something that would be too too speculative in a way for for you i think a, a model or a good theory is good that you can have these questions and so uh, nobody has had the question uh, uh, what is the limit of Newton mechanics until Einstein came up with really a new idea, but nobody could uh, imagine that. So, uh, so I'm not worried if somebody is coming up with something else, that's fine, but at least there is a model he can criticize it or work with it. I'm quite sure that it will not be very soon because uh, one idea behind this model is, which I developed in in the book Gehaltsesthetic, which is in a way, um, it's hidden here, as it's a premise, a hidden premise, is I developed such a, a theory of aesthetic eigenvalues. The human perception apparatus is finite, so you, you, you don't perceive in, in all bandwidth, you perceive in a special area, and, and, your, and our perception apparatus has special functions, that they are biological functions. And you, ha you have only a, a, fi a finite number of eigenvalues of perception. This is beauty, the sublime, the event, and ambivalence. The point is that the space of perception has been explored by the artist. And there, there could be only something new if, there, if our perception would be very different. So and then we have have the realm of language and meaning, and, and that is the, uh, the realm of concepts. So I'm not sure. I, I can't imagine an, uh, really an alternative, but you can try to find something. Yeah. yeah, maybe the extension of perception is something transhumanists are dreaming of. Thank you very much for this inspiring talk, Mr. Lehmann, and thank you for the discussion again. It was great. And it's uh, so sad that you couldn't be with us, but uh, maybe the next time when we are organizing a conference, let's say in Hawaii or something like that, we'll find the, we'll find the right spot for that. Uh, <laughs> so see you soon and greetings to Berlin. Thank you very much. And uh, I wish success with the conference. Thank you. Thank you so Goodbye. much.